So before I start talking about what this talk is about, I want to start with some charts. Basically, this is some selected countries and states. This is the progression of the coronavirus in the world. I've chosen some places that might interest us. Specifically, New York State now has a lot more cases than Spain and Italy. Spain and Italy used to be, uh, the, sadly, the leaders in coronavirus cases. And New York State itself now has a lot more cases than Spain and Italy. Um, I've chosen, like, I, I'm showing what the uh, situation in Israel and California used to be um, around the same numbers as Israel, but uh, in the last few days this changed. And also New Jersey is kind of an interesting place to look at because New Jersey has the same amount of population and the same uh, surface area as Israel, and yet they have around six more times the, ca the confirmed cases in Israel. So that's just to give you some perspective about how the coronavirus looks in places that uh, some of us live in. Uh, the coronavirus now has this magical word that's called the exponential curve. And they say that not many people can actually imagine the exponential curve. And even many people that work with data and we work with exponential curves, sometimes it's hard to imagine what this is. So one example that I like to look at is many of us in our uh, kind of business, we tend to talk about the hockey stick. It's this some magical point in time where sales become so much higher and grow exponentially. But the thing is, in the left chart, you can see uh, the hockey stick uh, in the, like 25 days or 25 months or 25 time points, basically. And if you zoom at the, like, the little rise here, you can see that it also looks like uh, an exponential curve, like a, a hockey stick. So basically, you always strive to be like for the major growth. But then you can't imagine like that in the next week, you're going to have uh, basically the same growth as you worked on for the last few months. And specifically, you can talk about coronavirus. It took us uh, about four months to get to one million confirmed cases around the world. And uh, it was a very huge thing in the newspapers, in the media. But now two weeks later, we're in two million people. And in two weeks... Again, we're going to be in 4 million confirmed cases unless things drastically change. And that's a huge number to think of. Like before we started quarantine around a month ago, we were still at the office and we talked about like 70% people sick in Israel, for example. And we couldn't imagine that this thing can change. And now a month later, we're at around 12,000 confirmed cases. Uh, and if I may, I'm going to speak specifically more about Israel. So this, this is basically how uh, an exponential curve looks like once we normalize the charts to be exponential. So the exponential curves look uh, like a linear curve. And uh, we can see that in Israel, things are getting better. So basically, uh, this used to be the rate around uh, like the number was growing very high, uh, very fast, and now we're kind of mellowing it down. But if a week ago I wanted to actually predict what's going to be the number of uh, sick people in, let's say, a month, we could see that my projections led to around 10 million sick people in Israel around um, May 15th. And that, that would be wrong because Israel doesn't have 10 million people. So for that, we need to use other models. So basically, um, all of us can imagine linear curves. Most of us can imagine like polynomial curves and stuff like that. And even exponential curves, once you're, you know how to handle them, you can imagine them. But disease modeling works differently. And uh, this talk's going to be about disease modeling. It's originally tended as a talk. It really shows how to do it in Python. I'm, I'm not sure everybody here is uh, fluent in Python, so I'm trying to make it more robust. You, you will see some Python code, but you can actually ignore that if you don't know Python or you're not interested in how to do it technically. 
a bit about myself. My name is Dean. I work in the company for the last nine months. Um, I'm also in an organization called Data Hack. We're working for advancing data science in Israel. And the reason why I'm here is that in my master's thesis, I worked on a disease called pertussis. We, we modeled how pertussis works. And basically what I'm going to show today is how we model any kind of disease. I'm not going to talk specifically about coronavirus. I'm not going to tell you any hard uh assumptions or any hard uh, things about like how to react with coronavirus. What I'm going to show you is how disease tend to act. And then when you see in the media, people talk about disease, maybe you have more informed opinions about that. What are we going to talk about? So basically, we're going to talk about dynamic models. And then we're going to talk about disease models that are a specific kind of dynamic models, then we're going to see some coronavirus data, and we'll talk about complex models, which will help us play with some data, and I'll end with some of my personal opinions. So what's a dynamic model? Basically, this is a flow chart, like everybody of us uh, seen a flow chart. So basically, let's say a person can be a kid, or an adult, or a mature person. And at each time point, let's say a time point is one year, they can actually grow from being a kid to being an adult or from being an adult to being mature. Another option is that two adults can create one kid and that around the 20 years that a person is considered an adult, they have 3.1 kids. That's uh, real data from the Israeli Bureau of Statistics. And also, if you become mature at around age 41, the, your, your chance of dying is around 3%. So basically, if we want to model that or we want to program that, we need to start with some starting point. Let's say in our population, we have 800 adults and 100 kids and uh, mature people. And basically, we need to create this step function. We need to say the kids at time point seven, time point would be a year a day, in our case, a year. So we take the amount of people that we had in the previous year, and then uh, let's say the adults create 3.1 children per couple, and some of the kids grow, so in the rate of 1 over 21, because at the age of 21, you become an adult. This is some Python code that you don't actually need to dig deep into, but basically what I just defined, uh, we use a, a, a loop in Python or in any other kind of language, and we just set the numbers in the top, we do a loop, and eventually, we get results. Those results would be uh, some array or some list that we can plot. And then we can see that in this specific examples, we started with a lot more adults in the population, but suddenly we have like, after some time, there are a lot more young people and old people in our population. And you can see that in total numbers and in the ratios in the population. What's a disease model? It's it's the basically the same, just instead of calling people old, young, mature, we say that a person could be susceptible to the disease, they can be infected with the disease, and they can be recovered from the disease. If you're susceptible, if you're infected, you have a recovery rate. So basically, if it takes you eight weeks to recover from the coronavirus, the recovery rate will be uh, one over eight of the infectious population become healthy after one week. And then you have something that's called the force of infection. So that, that's basically for now would be a magical number that depends on some inner properties of the disease. And that depends how infectious is the disease. And basically we do the same now, just now instead of using um, simple loops, we, we do what's called the differential equation. But the thing is, it's it's the same. Basically, people at time S, what's the chance of becoming infected? So that depends on the amount of people that are infected, the amount of people that are not infected. And you multiply that with the force of infection. You have this minus sign here because the arrow leaves this compartment. And if you have the plus sign here, the arrow enters into that compartment. And that's basically, that's the very basic model of disease modeling. It takes some time to actually sink into it, but it's not that hard. What is, it's not that hard to understand how it works. What is ours hard to imagine is what the result is gonna be.
for this, basically, we have some more Python code, but the important part is that we define some function that's basically says the same here. If you have minus beta si, you do minus beta s high. This is probably the most complex uh, slide in this talk. It's going to be not as complex from now. Eventually, we get, again, numbers, and those numbers we can plot. And this is the basic chart in epidemiology. As you can see, the red chart is the amount of infected people in the population in that example. What we see here is that even though we started with 1%, one person sick in a 10 million people population, very quickly, it becomes something that looks like the exponential curve that we all talk about. But eventually, it's not an exponential curve because 60% of the population became infected and they have nobody else to infect. So now people start to recover from the disease and the yellow, uh, the yellow line is the, the people that recovered from the disease. And you can see that this becomes higher than the, uh, the, the infected people until eventually nobody in the population becomes sick. That's in the case, like let's say for the chicken pox, that you cannot become sick again. Of course, it, it's not exactly like the chicken pox because in real world, new babies are born every day and they are susceptible to the disease. The thing is that the coronavirus is here. We are currently in an outbreak. The coronavirus is still not here in what we call a steady state. So each number you see in the news, in the media every day, it's a number that we're projecting to become higher. And the thing is, and the sad thing is, is that we still don't know where the peak is. I've heard some projections that it was supposed to be in the US six years, six days ago. It's, it probably wasn't. I'm not sure what's the new, what are the new projections? Another model that you can imagine is, uh, is, is some kind of model that after some years, let's say you have the flu, after you become recovered from the flu, you're pretty much immune to the flu, but for like two or three years. Then after that, you can again become infected with the flu. And you model it kind of the same. This is not the important part. The important part are the charts. So basically you see, uh, kind of the same graphs. So basically, so you see an outbreak, then the disease diminishes, but because other people can become infected again, then you can see a mini outbreak after some times, and then another mini outbreak until eventually you get into what we call a steady state. But if you zoom in on the red line, you can see that it does not diminish to zeros ever. It actually has some small fraction of the population that's, that, that's sick with the flu at, at every day. And you can imagine that that makes sense because every day in the office, the, some, there's someone who didn't show up because they were sick. It, it's always some other person, but there's always the one person, at least the one person. And the flu, this, this little guy is the, is the flu virus. The flu is in the steady state. The difference between a steady state and the outbreak is that we can expect the steady state. So even if the numbers are large, we can, we can know that they're as, as large as they will be the next year and the year after that, and we can prepare for that. Let's see some coronavirus data. So basically, you've seen those uh, data points in the first slide. This is Israel from February 22nd until April 3rd. And on this, we can fit some lines. So the blue line is the exponential curve. The red line is the line, it's the disease model that's fitted for uh, this data. It's harder to find. It's not like a simple linear regression, if you know the term. You need to do some more work. If anybody is specifically interested, I have a talk in YouTube that explains exactly how to find this magical number that's called beta. It's basically magical, but it's but it, as long as it's consistent with other parameters, uh, it, the the real value is not important as long as it's you can compare it with other betas of other diseases. Uh, that was not completely scientific what I just said, but that's basically it. So you fit a model to the data and then after some time you can actually project that model. And here, this, this was what's gonna be in Israel if we didn't take any mitigation efforts. We were expecting that around the middle of May, we've, we had 
5 million active people that have the disease in a 9 million people population. You can see that the exponential curve, the regular exponential curve, if you see in some of those projections, become irrelevant after some time. The yellow line is the recovered people. So you could have seen that if we didn't take any mitigation efforts, and also we did not think about like the efforts of the health uh, system, if we were in a regular disease that's not very deadly, we just uh, let the disease be, people will just sick for some time, and eventually at the end of September, the disease would have diminished off. Sadly, the coronavirus does require hospitalization and stuff like that, so we have to take mitigation efforts. To think about mitigation efforts, first we need to talk about some complex models. So this is an example for more complex model. This is a bit of my master's thesis. Basically, you have a, a more complex model on its own that includes vaccine and includes some decision um, uh, decision points that you can make, like decide if the year is after 20, uh, 2019 or the, the year is before 2010, stuff like that. You can give a vaccine or you could not give a vaccine. And you take everything here and you also multiply that by the ages. So basically you've seen the first model that's, a, that's an age model. And you see the second model, which is a disease model. And now you combine those two because a person could be uh, infected at the age of 10 and also infected at the age of 20. Why, does that why is that important? Because people that are age 20 does, do not meet the people at the age of 10 the same amount as they meet people at the age of of 20, or the uh, kids at five year old meet mostly kids that are five and also people that are around 30, their parents. And basically uh, this is the matrix that says, if, if I'm five, then my chances of meeting a person that's five is uh, very hot. Like the, the, the hotter the color is, the, more the, ch the, ch the higher the chances. And uh, you multiply that by the chance of meeting some other people by the strength of the disease. And basically you get more like really complex uh, formulas that actually explain how infectious the disease is. You don't have to get uh, into the formulas. The thing is that now you can imagine that the disease is very complex. It's not just like, just like a linear curve or exponential curve. This is actually becoming some seasonal curve. You, we know that many diseases are seasonal and you fit that to the data and you get some estimate of how the disease looks like. And now that we know a bit about models and a bit about complex models, we can uh, play with some ideas. So let's say we have a model that looks kind of like what I showed you, but instead of being susceptible, you can be one of two uh, decision. You can be actually a susceptible person that does not listen to, that does not obey the rules and does not quarantine themselves, or you could be one that does quarantine themselves. And if you quarantine yourself and you're susceptible, you have a chance of becoming infectious but still quarantine yourself, or you can become infections, infectious person that does not quarantine themselves. And here we have the reduction rate. So basically I can say that uh, if I'm quarantining myself, my chances of meeting another person that, that's quarantined them, themselves is uh, 25 times less uh, probable. And my chances of meeting a person that does not quarantine themselves is only 10 times less probable. While two people that, does not, that do not quarantine themselves, they're as probable as meeting uh, as uh, they have the same chance of meeting each other as, as, as if nobody did. So basically you can think of uh, your friend that, that does qu keep quarantine. Your chances of meeting your friend is only if both of you went to the supermarket at the same time and you met in the same aisle. Well, you have a chance of meeting the pizza delivery guy uh, it, it is higher. And, but two people that are, let's say, essential workers, or I'm not doing justice with saying this, do not obey the rules, but let's say... A, a, uh, essential workers, they have to don't to not obey the rules. The chances of meeting each other, let's let's say two doctors, is the same as as it was if we didn't have the disease, or maybe higher. But for this kind of example, let's say uh, it's the same chance. And basically, we can say that if the population is obedient, 
it doesn't have to be the entire population, but in this case, uh, if 85% of the population, and th those are simulated numbers, so don't take the numbers specifically, but we don't have to have everybody obeying the rules for us to diminish the disease. If 85% of the people here listen to the rules, the disease would basically not outbreak. The infectious uh, people are in the red line, and you can see that they never get to that point. But yet, if only 30% of people did not obey the, rule, obey the rules and 70% did not, you can see that the outbreak still have happened, but not as high if nobody listened to the rules. And you can see that in the example that nobody listens to the rules, you have 4% of the population that are sick in the steady state, while only 1.5% are sick uh, in, the, in this reality that 30% of people listen to the rules. And you can see this, and this is the most important chart in my talk, I believe. Basically, if nobody is obedient to the rules, we could have had the chance that 60% of the population were sick together. If we did not take mitigation efforts, if we did not listen to the rules, if we did nothing, then we could have had a chance where 60% of the population were sick. And in those kind of models, it's not that bad, right? Because then the pick, uh, the pick uh, become like starts early and then it diminishes early. So why not do it? The thing is that in reality, let's say that in 10% of people, the capacity of the health system uh, is destroyed and then you, you can expect a lot more deaths in the population and basically a lot of more uh, like a worse situation in any measure. But the nice thing is to look at it is if 50% if of the population is obedient to the rules, you can see how the peak is actually later, but it's a lot less it's a lot lower and if we look at 25 if we look at 85 percent we've seen before that you actually diminish the disease but even if you look at like let's say 70 percent of the people are obedient to the rules you can see how the curve is being flat and then that's uh the thing that i actually like for, for this is we're here when you hear the term flattening the curve this is it it's not some complex uh, statistical thing. It basically means if you listen to the rules, if you take mitigation efforts, if you quarantine yourself, then the chances of the disease to get into a peak that's unreasonable for the health system is a lot less severe. We, we would expect the peak to arrive later because uh, it, it arrives... It, it, drives itself slower, so it arrives later, but then it's manageable. You actually give the health system a chance. Some of my personal opinion, so if you look at a person, uh, I've only done this for a master's thesis, but basically many people that you hear that you've done, you've worked with some of those things, ask you for your opinion. And the thing is that I don't have an opinion. And if somebody would say, well, you had your master's thesis in this, you're not a doctor, not anything, but you know more than the most of the people about it, and you say, give us something, I'd say that there's no place for opinion. We, you can see in mostly the internet, many people have opinions about it. They say, we should open the economy, we should not open the economy. This is what I think. I think many people would become uh, depressed, so we have to, because this would lead to more death. And the premise itself could be correct, but the thing is that without data, these are only opinions and we don't have the luxury of talking about the coronavirus in the term of opinions. And this is, I think, the most, um, like, this is a very good example for that. Many people would say that the flu is much worse than the coronavirus. And in this kind of example, this is a page uh, an Israeli page that basically has taken many causes of death of many um, reasons to die. And I've translated for you the first two. And it says that the flu had 113,000 cases in 2019 until March 25th. And the, the coronavirus only killed 22,000 people. And that was correct for March 25th. The thing is that... Now we are three weeks later, and I've tracked that daily. 
and every day I said that the flu only had 10% rise, uh, while the COVID-19 had 100% rise, 10 times more. And today, actually, this is from the like an hour before the talk, I've actually updated the number, and we can say that the COVID-19 this year killed more people than the flu. And if you check this in two hours more, you can see that the, it's now 2,000 people more and 10,000 people more. So uh, it's like a very sad win for the people that said that the COVID-19 is, is a lot more dangerous than the flu. I'm not happy that more people are dying, but it, I, I'm hoping for this to be some kind of a proof that we should take this seriously. And... Uh, Basically, this is Anthony Fauci. Anthony Fauci is the director of Allergy and Infectious Disease uh, Center in the United States. He's now everywhere in the news. He's advising very closely to the president. And he said in a CNN interview, he said, you don't make the timeline, the virus makes the timeline. What this means, most many country leaders treat this as a war. And in some sense, we are in a war. The thing is, when we say this word war, we imagine a war that we're familiar with. In a war, we have two countries or two opposing sides that are kind of the same, and you can take the upper hand if you make the timeline to the enemy. The thing is, we don't have that with the coronavirus. The virus makes the timeline. The only thing we can do is to have mitigation efforts. We can re react better or worse, but the virus makes the timeline. A few things to end with, uh, listen to the health experts in your countries, in your states, even if some policy does not seem optimal and you think there's a better one, if you're the only one that's enacting upon the better option, you've done nothing. It's better if we take the not optimal route, but everybody is doing it together to actually have the effect. Another thing is don't fall in love with promising models. You can see in the news that some PhD in some university or some CEO of some company said, I found a solution, just isolate the elderly and it, it, will, it will just take care of itself. Those articles in the media usually, usually are, is, are not supported by rigorous um, statistics and rigorous data. And basically they are, as I said before, opinions. They could be true if some uh, university does this research, you can, you can actually find a number that says, well, at this point, the economy suffers more and results in more dead people than from the disease. But the thing is, we're not sure yet. It, it's a very rigorous research to do that does not take one week of uh, some three programmers to actually type some numbers into the computer and come out with a magic number. Another thing is that masks work. Um, there's some kind of a race to buy the largest stock you can buy of the N95 mask. The thing is that masks do not work for protecting you, most masks. If you have the best N95 mask, but you don't protect your eyes and you speak to a infectious person, then you probably will get sick. But what they what masks do is protecting other people. If that sick person that you talk with, they wear the masks, then they are protecting you. So do your part in protecting other people. You don't know, symptoms show two weeks after you got the disease and do your part in protecting the entire populations. There are actually, there's actually research that show that the, the higher the, um, a uh, percent of people in the population that are wearing masks, the less chance of the population of attracting the virus. And for this uh, kind of uh, protection, even if you just put a shirt on your face, and even if you enter YouTube, there are many uh, tutorials of how to make your own mask. Those work wonderfully. So do your part in protecting other people. Last thing is that you're not immune. We work in tech, we're probably smarter, more educated, and we have more money than the regular person in Israel and the regular person in uh, the United States. It helps because we meet less people and the chances of us attracting the virus are a lot smaller and yet you're not immune. Don't live in a false feeling of 
security. You can have the chance uh, this day. Actually, I live in a very small suburb with a thousand people. And today we got the first case. It's a suburb with, uh, again, people here are more educated, earn more money than the average. And yet there's one person that's now with the disease. And now it maybe maybe she walked in the streets uh, next to me. Maybe we went to the same, the, to the one shop we have in the, in the place. And we, we don't know how many people attracted the virus, even, we, even if we were very careful, very um, uh, feeling secure, we were not. And so basically don't think you're immune. I'll finish off with that uh, slide. We said all models are wrong, but some are useful. So a guy named George Box said it. It was a statistician that said, well, we can't model everything. And even the models I've showed you are very simple. If you're, even if you're taking a model that's a thousand times more complex, it would not, it would not model reality one-to-one. -one. But some are useful because we can actually derive some assumptions and some um, statistics to know uh, what what we project to be in the future. So we could rely on models, but they have to be very rigorous, very robust, and they have to rely on a lot of data and a lot of research. Um, this is me. Those are my social profiles. Those are two open source packages that I maintain. You're welcome to check them. And uh, if anybody has questions, then uh, I could answer.